Welcome to Author Author. My name is Sven Michael Davison, and today I have a return of Greg Nichols talking about his path to writing, basically how he became a journalist, uh, how he got his first gig, and his uh, unique perspective on adventure writing. So here we go. How did you even get into writing? I mean, it, it sounds like you obviously, you know, you had your sights on it going to college, but yeah. I mean, how did you even go from like being a student to starting getting your first articles? You know, yeah. what was that whole process? Um, so, that's a good question. I, th there was actually like a moment when I decided I wanted to be a writer, and it's kind of like a, like a, almost like a trope. My mom, uh, at one point in high school, said something like to the effect of, being a writer is a really good gig. You can do that from anywhere in the world. And that was like, I had this like, it was like the switch flipped from like non-writer Greg to like engaged writer Greg. Like now I'm a writer. <laughs> it yeah. decided that that's what I wanted to do. Um, and then I was like, I better go read some books and figure out if that's really what I want to do. <laughs> it's, I'm joking a little bit because I did love books, but um, that's that's how it started. And then through college, it was just uh, this like this aimless sitting in coffee shops, smoking cigarettes, and like swilling coffee and reading books and talking to people who were other people who wanted to be writers. And then I was a terrible student in college, but somehow uh, I got into grad school, um, who knows how. <laughs> and the grad school thing, I, I, I went in as a fiction writer and, uh, and once I made that turn to nonfiction, and this actually, one of the things that really appealed to me about nonfiction was that there actually was like a game plan for a career in some sense. Um, and I'm a, I got into writing to be like an artist, and I got into writing to like sit in a coffee shop and smoke cigarettes. And I don't smoke anymore, and I also don't sit in coffee shops as much as I would like because it's, it turns out it's like a career that keeps you really busy. Um, Sitting in coffee shops or writing? Writing is a career that keeps you really busy, yeah, totally. Uh, although, again, college days, coffee shop was a, was a, a full-time job. Big scene, yeah. Kept me out of class. Um, no, but, but sometimes what gets lost in that vision of, of like wanting to be an artist uh, or in that, that, that like holding up your heroes, um, whoever it is, you know, the, the great writers that you envision and you want to be, is the pragmatism it takes to actually become successful in uh, in writing or in anything else? I mean, it's it's it is a career, and like you're entering an industry, um, and that's so like grossly unsexy to think about and to say, and it so flies in the face of a lot of the of the instincts that like that maybe propel you to want to be a writer, uh, like an artist or a craftsman. Like you don't want to be a cog in a wheel or like a working stiff or I don't know. You want to you don't want to you don't want to work for the man or whatever it is. Like, you want to be an artist. You want to be un, unfettered, and and you really do need to play a game. So when I took that turn to nonfiction, I saw like, okay, there's um, there's this world of like magazines, and there are these beautiful things called magazine features, and there's a certain type within that taxonomy that's like this beautiful narrative treatment of stories, and so all of a sudden there was like an actual job that encompassed the writing part of it and the craft part of it that it's not a lucrative job but like it is it, it you can make money doing it um and like it facilitates that travel thing and that adventure thing that i love and so that that helped me i, I think pivot and um and, and sort of like propel myself out of grad school into this larger career where i think a lot of a lot of my cohort have maintained that I want to be a writer thing and, and sitting in a coffee shop. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's much harder to make like an impact as a writer if you're not also going to like play the writer game, I guess. Is, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So how did you make that practical leap into getting your first like paid gig? But have that come about? I moved to Medellin, Colombia, and uh, like leveraged my access to really cool stories down there against my complete inexperience as a journalist. And I was like, I'm here, and I'm cheap. And I was just contacting editors at magazines. Um, so that was right after grad school, and this is before my first book. Um, and I had no clips whatsoever. My wife and I moved down to Colombia just to kind of have an adventure and to try it. We knew like some Spanish, but really we were like learning while we were down there. I was blindly pitching editors. Wow. Yeah. So what was your what was your first your first bite? Oh God. Um, it was about there's a flower festival in Medellin that is pretty epic, and it, they 
just like this huge parade of flowers. They come down and there's some interesting connections with historical connections with cartels because they were very prominent in, in the community at a certain point. So I wrote a story, I forget what the magazine is. It was like a flower specific magazine. Oh, wow. Like they had to talk about niche. Wow. Yeah. And, and here in the U.S., was it like a, like it was a national magazine or it international was a, magazine? Or was it a... Yeah, yeah it was, it's, I think it's a, it was a U.S.-based publication. Okay, gotcha. Uh, yeah. I can find wow. a clip somewhere. You can put it in the notes. Very cool. Yeah. And then after that, you just uh, you, you wrote about Columbia for a while, and that was kind of how you... Yeah, we were there for a year. Um, and then, you know, I came back with, like, a decent number of clips. Nowhere, like, prestigious, but um, just kind of enough to, to start conversations with editors. And... I still didn't know like what kind of story I wanted to write in magazines at that point. Um, there's lots of different stories in magazines, but I sort of slowly, through trial and error, came to realize, and through some like just horrendous reporting experiences, where I'm like, I don't want to write this kind of story, like business type stories. Like, ugh, I just, it's not my thing. I don't like understand it very well, and I, I'm not sure it doesn't feel right. As opposed to other kinds of stories, which are more narrative in their um, in their like presentation and their their execution, I sort of figured out that that's where I wanted to go, and slowly over time, and this is still something that I'm I'm figuring out, but I I have figured out exactly the kind of story I like to write, um, and it tends to be this like this adventure story, featuring oddball characters put in situations where they're like way outside of their comfort zone and they're. Um, I don't know, they're forced to confront like some, some just crazy situation. Uh, so that's kind of like what I look for in a story. And when you say adventure, you're talking about like adventures we have just as human beings. You're not talking about just like, a, like somebody traveling. Totally. It, could be, it yeah. could be both. Yeah, good, good distinction. It could be both, yeah. So like um, definitely like one that straddles the line between I think both of those types of things is like an expedition that goes wrong, right? That's got the like typical what you think of as like an outdoor adventure. Um, but then something goes haywire, and that's where like the narrative fun comes in. But yeah, it, it could also be like a heist. Um, I love heist stories and crime stories, and uh, like I wrote a piece about undercover CHP officers who infiltrated motorcycle gangs in LA. And the CHP does not really do undercover operations, so this, they put it together with uh, with bailing wire and shoestring, and they pulled off this like epic undercover score where they infiltrated some of the, the biggest uh, motorcycle thieves in the country uh, by like becoming part of their groups and just infiltrating that whole scene. So like that that to me is has the spirit of adventure. Like these these four guys like going it alone and going undercover is adventurous and that's what I love. The only thing that I think is really has been really valuable for me is again this idea of pragmatism and and squaring that with with your artistic drive. There is no better recipe for being totally depressed and just shooting yourself in the face than trying to be a pure artist without engaging whatever like marketplace or whatever whatever world or ecosystem that art is being consumed in because it's like it's endlessly frustrating and and it's hard to get anywhere and like you're basically betting that you're going to win the lotto if you're just producing the best work you can and then kind of blindly like just sending it out there like it's it's bigger than that and and so starting to reorient your thinking to like it's it's a puzzle that you're putting together and like you have to start putting pieces down. You have to start taking chances and, and putting your work out there in some way. Um, but then it's about like decision making and figuring out where the next logical place to go is. And it's amazing how quickly you can like reorient your thinking. That that shift I was talking about between fiction and nonfiction that I took in grad school. Before that happened, I as like a as a writer of fiction and a, and a primary reader of fiction. I would have, if asked, kind of poo-pooed nonfiction as like the lesser art. And it was pretty incredible how quickly, like once that became something that like, like a door opened and I saw that, how quickly I, I threw myself fully into that and became as artistically and creatively invested in nonfiction. Um, and so you can reorient your thinking. So don't, don't, my advice to anybody, and like this has served me well, is don't artificially put yourself in a lane just because, I don't know, that like designation exists as an ISBN or like Library of Congress designation. Like I am a nonfiction writer, or I am a fiction writer, or I am a poet, or whatever. 
Um, and the same with anything. Like you can also be a screenwriter. Like you don't have to. You don't have to choose. Um, like at some point, figuring out where your strengths are and, and where you're going to invest your time is going to be really important. But you don't have to constrain yourself artificially. And keeping your eyes open for opportunities is absolutely the way to to just kind of make it all work and and I think lead a fulfilling and self-sustaining life as a creative person. So Striking Good Iron is about a steel strike in 1959, which was the largest industrial work stoppage in the nation's history. 500,000 steel workers walked off the job. And during that strike was the high school football season. And in this town called Braddock, Pennsylvania, there was this team that had gone five seasons without losing a game. On the eve of the sixth season, if they successfully won every single game, they would break the, the national record for consecutive games without a loss. So Sports Illustrated came down, and uh, there was just a ton of national media attention around this scrappy group of Steel Town boys. Please subscribe so my dad can make more videos like this. Thank you.